Hi, my name is Feline Hermans. I'm assistant professor at Delft University of Technology, and I'm here today to talk about spreadsheets. So you might think, why are we talking about spreadsheets at a developer's conference? Well, spreadsheets are very often mislabeled. People think of spreadsheets as being data, but they are really wrong. Spreadsheets are actually code. I go all around the world to spread the happy word, the gospel of my life, and tell people that spreadsheets are code. So please, if you remember only one thing of this entire talk, please let it be that spreadsheets are code. You might not believe me, that's okay. I have three reasons for you why spreadsheets are actually should be considered as pieces of programming. First of all, they're used for very similar problems. Here you have an investment calculator, you put some data in, something is being calculated, and you get some output. You could do this with any programming language. You could do it in Java or in C Sharp or in PureScript. I just learned that about that today, really cool. But you could also do it in a spreadsheet. A typical data calculation problem, you could use a spreadsheet for that. Obviously, you could ask yourself the question, why would I do this in a spreadsheet? Why do people do this in a spreadsheet and not in a proper language? Well, I can tell you why people do this in spreadsheets. It's because we as developers, we are bad at making software. Those people, the guy that built it, I, I've asked people like that, you know, why do you do it in a spreadsheet? Why didn't you ask IT to build something for you? And he said, yes, we did that. And they said it was going to be three million and six months, and it was 10 million and nine months, and it had half the features we wanted. So from that perspective, spreadsheets look really easy and cheap. You have it already on your machine, and you think, hey, I can do it myself. People perceive themselves sometimes as being better, for, better developers than we are. So reason one, used for very similar problems. So I go to great lengths to make my point. To such great lengths, in fact, that I have implemented a Turing machine in spreadsheet formulas to show that spreadsheet formulas are actually Turing complete. So here you see it. One row of the spreadsheet is one iteration of the lint, and you actually see the hat moving over the Lint, I think it's a very cool visualization of a Turing machine, as well as being proof that spreadsheet formulas are Turing complete. Reason three, spreadsheets suffer from very typical software problems. They suffer from very typical software problems. For instance, they often lack a manual, like software. They stay alive for a very long time, and during their lifespan, they're used by many different people. So all in all, I think we can conclude that spreadsheets are code. They suffer from the same problems, they are just as complex, and they're used for very similar problems. I'm going to go a little bit further than that. I'm not just going to argue that spreadsheets are a programming language. I'm going to argue that spreadsheet language, spreadsheets are the next language that you should learn. Resistance is futile. And again, you may not believe me, I have a few reasons why you should learn Spreadsheet as your next programming language. First of all, they are live programming. You know, Brad Victor is going around making, making fame on the internet saying, oh, we need live programming. We need to have code on the one hand side and the, run, the running of the code at the same time. We have that since physical. I mean, the spreadsheet is live programming of on a letter. You put in a formula, and you immediately get the result. No compiling needed. So it's live programming. Second reason that you should learn spreadsheet. Do you like pure functional languages? You, you know, you, we all love Haskell. Forget about Haskell. <laughs> Spread Spreadsheet formulas are pure. The only thing a formula can do is take input from other cells and do a calculation based on it. No side effects are possible. It's impossible from a spreadsheet formula to do anything else but present the result. They are pure, a pure functional language. Third reason you should learn spreadsheets is they are the lingua franca of computing. Everyone knows spreadsheets. You know, your next door neighbor is managing his fantasy football team in a spreadsheet. Your accountant, like the boring, most boring guy on earth, he knows how to do spreadsheets. Everyone knows this shit, but us developers, that's crazy. We should know what everyone else is programming. So I'm going to assume for a minute that you are convinced that you should learn pro spreadsheet programming. And since you're here in the room, 
Anyway, let's do a little spreadsheet programming. I'm going to implement selection sorts in spreadsheet formulas to show you the real power of spreadsheets. So selection sort, I'm going to assume you're familiar with it. You sort a list by picking the minimum and putting it at the front of the row and you do that repeatedly and your list of integers is sorted. So how do we do this in a spreadsheet? I have a list of numbers here. I'm just going to add the rank, the index of the number for convenience. So the first thing obviously we need to do is take the minimum. Spreadsheets, Excel in this case, we have a nice function called the minimum. Super easy, min with the, as an argument, are a list. By the way, what you could also do, I'm not going to use that, but this is a little known uh, syntax, is you can also use an entire row. So we could also pick the minimum of the entire row. And just as you can also take the minimum of A colon A, that's a little bit more known syntax. And we're going to use this later on. So I'm just going to show you, you can also take the minimum of one row. What we need next, obviously, is the index of the minimum, the position where the minimum is in the list. And we can use a match function for that. And what a match function does, it's going to look at this thing, the one, and going to return the location within the list. So we get 10. That's correct because our minimum is on index 10. So we're going to start small because you're not doing this every day. So we're going to make a not sort immediately, but we're going to start with a simple formula. This formula is just going to mark places where we are going to swap later with an X and an underscore for all the places where we're not going to swap. So we can gradually build up the formula so it's easier to get all the steps. So the first part of our formula is if our index is equal to the index that the minimum is on, then we're going to swap and otherwise we just place an underscore. And ah, this is still quite easy. We can drag this along, but something is wrong. There's no X there. Does anyone know what I have forgotten here? Yes. The, uh, the dollar, yeah, the dollar sign. Yes, exactly, the dollar sign. So if you drag a formula along, Excel automatically updates all the references unless you put a dollar sign in there. So now you see here we've dragged it, but it's actually referring to this one and that guy instead of this one. So if we put a dollar here and drag it again, then you see we get an X on the swapping sign. And we're going to, we know that we're going to drag everything down later on, so let's just put a dollar here because we know that we're, we're going to use the index row. So obviously we need the other thing to swap with, which is the index of the swap. We start at the first index and then we're gradually moving along the row that we're going to sort. And then we need to do sort of a reverse lookup. What we need to do now is look up what value goes with the swap function. And we can do that in Excel with an index function. Might be a little bit contraintuitive because in some programming languages the max is the index. But it's as it is, the index, and what it does is it's going to return from this block that the row and the column you put into it. So the first row, it is just one row, and this column. So we get 13. And we can update now our function because we can add the different the other branch. We had the branch for swapping the one value, now we can add the branch for swapping. If we are, our index is equal to the swap index, we are also going to switch values. So we have now correctly marked the two places where we're going to swap. Let's now pick the easiest thing to fill in. What are we going to do in the position of the underscore? Well, that's sort of easy. If we are not swapping, we're just going to pick the value right above us. Super easy. So now we have done everything. All the things that don't have to change, they're not changed in the next line, but we are going to change the swaps. Let's do something first. Let's add a little bit of conditional formatting to make it easier for us to see what's going on. So I'm going to make the swap spots yellow and green so I can easily see what is going on. And this is very similar to what I did in a Turing machine, also with conditional formatting. I made the head of the lint very easy. So, we're going to change this. What do we have to do if our index of the minimum is equal to the index of the swap? What do we have to output then? The thing you want to swap. The thing you want to swap, correctly, the minimum. And in the, in the other case, if we're, our index is equal to the index of swap, then we're going to output the minimum. Easy peasy. Huh? 
there we have it. We have swapped two values, super easy. So we're almost done. We can just drag this down and then we do this until, just until the list is sorted. Uh, fortunately, something is wrong. It's almost correct. And you see how the conditional formatting helps us to understand. And it's like a debugger for spreadsheets, the conditional <laughs> formatting. <laughs> Who knows what I forgot? Has anyone seen my mistake? Yes. Yeah, so I'm now taking the minimum of the entire list, so obviously I continue to find the one and swap out that one. So you see the minimum is, the minimum is one everywhere. So Excel has you covered. We have a function for that called the offset. And what offset does is it, you put in a range and then you move that range over the spreadsheet, rows and columns. So you can move, we can move our minimum, we're going to move it zero um, rows and B minus, B4 minus one column. So the first time we're not moving it at all and then in the next row we're moving it one, two, three, four, and then you can see every time we're picking the minimum of the correct row. So let's see what happens if we update it. Ah, isn't that wonderful? We have done selection sort in a spreadsheet. not there yet because I know if I would stop now you would say yeah but that's not programming with all the E2 and B4 that's not how we normally program we want to have a more beautiful version so let's do that level two a little bit scary you, you have all seen macros and Lisp, so I'm sure you can deal with some scary stuff in the spreadsheet so first funky syntax feature does anyone know what this formula means so it's a range and then a space and then another range. This is correct syntax. I didn't know that. I only know this because I built a parser of spreadsheet formulas and I put in millions and millions of spreadsheets and then I hit this. I was like, what does that even do? What if, and then I input it into a spreadsheet and I said, oh, that's cool. So anyone know what this means? Your next door neighbor does. Your accountant does. <laughs> Come on, guys. No? Okay, I'll help you a little bit. It's the intersection of these two ranges. So the output of this formula is the intersection of two ranges. So in this case, it will be three. And I can use this neat trick to make my formula a little bit cooler. Let's give things some names. Ah, that's what programmers like. So let's say the row of all the indexes, I just call that index. And then I can use that to change my formula. So here I was directly pointing at E2. With the spaces trick, I can now change my function into the intersection of the index and the E column. So this is my column and this is the index. So now I don't have to point at it anymore, E2. I can just say, give me wherever my column is intersecting, intersecting with index. And the cool thing about this syntax is that the space, the column I'm in, is not mandatory. So you can remove it, you can just drop it, and the the function will be exactly the same. So what this still means is give me the value wherever I am intersecting with index. So that makes it a little bit nicer. And I can repeat this trick a few times. So let's say this is swap, this is the index of swap, this is min, and this is index min. This is how I'm going to call those named ranges. And then I can change this into this. Isn't that nice? It's almost like, 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 like reading a book, reading a novel. If the index is min, then swap. If the index is swap, then min. Awesome. There's just one thing, of course, that I really hate. It's this guy. E3 needs to go. It needs to disappear. But I can't use an easy trick like I did with the indexes with the named ranges because every time I drag my formula down, it will change. So I have to go even scarier. So let's dive a little bit deeper into named ranges because so far we have just been using named ranges as you probably already knew them. You give a name to a value, to a cell, I mean. You point at a cell and you say this is min, this is swap. So you put a formula in or you put a cell reference in here. But you can put other things in that field. You can give named ranges they're still called named ranges, but they don't have to be named ranges. What you could, for instance, put in there, all you need is love. You can put a constant in there, and now the named range, all you need, will result in the value love. Isn't that nice? All you need is love. Love is all you need. 
Isn't that fantastic? But you can put in scarier things in your named ranges than just constants. There were other thinkers, by the way, besides the Beatles, who have also thought about what exactly the essence of love is. Here's a guy I particularly like. However much I love you, you will always love me more. Well, I can do that in a named range. My love is 15. And so this is still the same. My love, your love, we can just put in a constant, 15. But what I can do now is I can make a second named range, your love, depending on the first named range. So I can say 1.3 times my love. So I've put a formula into a named range. Instead of a constant, instead of a cell reference, I put in a formula. And this actually works, so you just get, you put in your love and then it's 19.5. So you use a named range, but actually something is calculated in the back. We can go crazier than that. Here's another thing we can express in spreadsheets. Every day I love you more. So, little formula, my love is 15. What do I have to do now? Obviously, I have to make something to point to the cell above because I want to use the value of the cell above as an input for my name range. So what can I do? I can use the row function. Normally, you put in a cell there, so you can do the row of A8 results in 8. But what you can also do is use it without arguments, and then it just returns the row I am in right now. It's sort of disparate row, if you may. I can use that in my name range because I can say yesterday's love, so the love I'm going to use right above me, is on the location of my row, minus one, and my column. So now I have here, it, this outputs just a string where I want to point that. So I'm almost there, C4, and this is the right location, but instead of the string of the cell reference, I need to have, actually have the reference there. So there's a thing in Excel, it's called the indirect. It's very much like an eval. You put in a string, and what you get is the reference of that string. So this formula is exactly equal to this formula. Indirect of a string is exactly equal to that reference. I can use that. So I can say yesterday's love is the eval, the indirect of the cell of my row minus one and my column. Ta, 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 ta. I can now use this value as an input for my named range. So I can say, okay, today's love is what yesterday's love times the Van Buren factor 1.004. And if I drag it down, now I have a formula in a named range that is dependent on the cell above it. So every time it refers to the cell, gets the value and does the calculation. We can use that to get rid of the, that annoying E3 because I didn't come here to talk about love, I came here to talk about selection sort. So we can use <laughs> dynamic name ranges to get rid of that annoying E3. We, it has to go. So what we can do is we can make a dynamic name range that is the previous row. Just as we said yesterday's love, the previous row is the indirect of the row above me and here I use that min syntax that I showed you all the way at the beginning of my talk, one row, you can use it to point that. So I just say the row above me, and now it's this. Isn't this nice? Just for comparison, I wrote also selection sort in Python, and you can see it's almost the same. Actually, <laughs> I think my thing is a lot conciser. Look at that. Who is winning now, Python? <laughs> Isn't that cool? So, of course, now I'm going to talk a little bit about my own research. Now you are convinced that spreadsheets are actually proper source code. I can pitch my own research here because if you are going to argue that spreadsheets are source code, then maybe we can apply some software engineering methods to spreadsheets. This is exactly the idea of my entire PhD thesis that you can see here. I defended this last year and the idea of my entire PhD thesis is that if you look at spreadsheets as code, you can actually help spreadsheet users to be more like professional programmers. Because obviously, you know, we are not that good at making software, but we have tools for that. We have a super smart IDE that gives us auto-completion and syntax highlighting. That IDE is one of the things that makes us better programmers. And we have integrated 
integrated build systems, testing. Spreadsheet users lack all those tools, so we can, it's easy to make fun of them because, well, they make errors in their spreadsheets, but yeah, they don't really have the tools. So the idea of my research is to transfer tools from software engineering to spreadsheets to help people understand their spreadsheets better and to just be more professional like software developers. So yeah, the idea of my research is we can help spreadsheet developers with software engineering methods. So one of the things I've built is called Bumblebee and this is a refactoring tool for spreadsheet formulas. I'm going to show you a little bit about how it looks now. So here you have, it's a plugin in Excel. We have a typical formula that some, someone could have written in a spreadsheet because he doesn't really know spreadsheets. So you have a sum divided by a count, but obviously it would have been easier if you would use the built-in average function there. But maybe you didn't know it, maybe you were in a hurry, maybe this, the formula has evolved because first it was sum and then after that, you thought, oh, I still need to divide by count, and it turned into an average. So our system knows that. You can ask Bumblebee, give me possible rewrites on my formula, and it says, oh, I can do that. I have found for you the sum and count to average refactoring that you can apply on this formula. And if you like it, you can say, yes, apply it for me. It's applied, and then, hop, we rewrite your formula to a better version, an easier version, and you can apply it not only in a range, but also over an entire worksheet or over an entire workbook, eradicate all the formulas that you don't want to use anymore and replace them by better versions. And we thought we can go a little bit further than that. We can help users to define their own refactoring because we thought, now spreadsheet developers, the power users, they're really good at writing formulas, they're maybe even writing a VB, they should be able to define their own refactorings in the spreadsheet. So we made a little language that you can see here where users within their spreadsheet can define rewrite rules, refactorings, and then they can subsequently apply those refactorings within their spreadsheet. So you can say on every formula, doesn't matter what it is, that's what the uh, square bracket means, I can always round it. On a formula that looks like this, here's the sum and count, that looks like sum something divided by count something, I can transform that into the average. We haven't really started testing this part yet with users, but we assume that the users that are familiar with VB and with complex formulas should also be able to write these type of things. So obviously, if you say refactoring, you say, <laughs> testing, yeah, you guys are still awake. If you say refactoring, you say testing. If people are going to mess with their spreadsheet or their source code in an automated way, they want to know that the thing is still functioning as it was before. <laughs> so initially we thought, oh, this is going to be hard. How are we going to get professional spreadsheet users to test? It's already so hard to get professional developers to test. It's not so easy. It's hard to to get people convinced of the idea that it's actually worth it to write tests, they will, it will help you in, in the end. So we thought, hmm, this is going to be hard. But this was a typical ivory tower approach where we were thinking at the university instead of looking what people were actually doing. Because when we started looking at spreadsheets, we saw many spreadsheets look like this. If the sum of these guys is not 100, then I'm going to output error. It's like a test, right? Or like an assertion. The user of this spreadsheet wanted to express that those, that block of cells needed to be equal to 100, otherwise, error, something strange is happening here. So we thought we can use these type of functions, these type of formulas that people are already writing, and we can leverage them to get people to test better because it's easier to reinforce behavior that people already have than to try to convince them to start to do something entirely different. So we build a tool called Expector, and what that tool does, another Excel plugin, is it can find those type of test formulas and elaborate upon it. So what the tool does, it says, hey, I've detected a test formula here, and based on some heuristics that we use for the words like okay, and error, and yes, and no, we even saw a smiley face as the output of a test. So we made a list of all the things that people use as positive and negative outcomes. We can even say, okay, we think in the case that it's not 100, it should fail, and otherwise it should pass. 
And if the user agrees with those tests, you can say, okay, save them to my system as a test suite. And then you can use that because then you don't need to look manually for everything that says error or okay. We gather all the tests and everything that has a passing outcome, we make it green. And what we can do even is sort of do test coverage, show, visually show users the coverage of their tests by making use of the fact that this formula refers to those cells. Then I can say, okay, this is a test and it's passing. So I could say that these guys are also tested because they are covered by a test and if something is wrong there, at the end it would have been tested by this guy. And we can do the same thing here. We say this is a formula, it, it doesn't have a test yet and it depends on these guys. So we say this is not tested and the rest is also not tested. And this helps people to sort of understand the robustness of their spreadsheet, understand what they have tested yet and what parts of their spreadsheet could still benefit from some of those tests. And one of the follow-up things that we want to do, we haven't worked on that yet, but that's sort of our plan, is to combine this with complexity metrics of spreadsheet formulas that we already worked on. So we can not only say this part of your spreadsheet isn't tested yet, but we could also say this formula isn't tested and this is the most complex one in your spreadsheet. So probably you want to start with your test effort there first. So that's everything I wanted to talk to you about today. But before we go to questions, we have some time for that. I will summarize my entire talk in about a minute. So if you came in late or if you were still processing the transfuser trans thingies from before, <laughs> this is your second chance to get a hang of my entire talk. And obviously, if you were listening, this is the optimal preparation for question asking. So one thing, please remember this and tell all your friends, spreadsheets are code. This is what you absolutely need to remember. I am sure I have convinced you of this fact with this talk. They are used for exact similar purpose as many other programming languages. They are just as complex because they are Turing complete and they suffer, suffer from typical software problems. They are not just the programming language. They are the coolest thing out there because they are alive, they are purely functional and everyone already knows how to work with them. To show you how cool they are, I have implemented selection sort in a spreadsheet and it looks cooler than Python. <laughs> because spreadsheets are source code, you can use that idea to build upon it and to make people's spreadsheet lives better. And for that, I have built a refactoring tool for spreadsheets and a testing tool for spreadsheets. If you like my talk, you can go to my website where you can download those two plugins, Bumblebee and Expector. If you have Excel 2010, you can download them, play with them, provide me with feedback. If you want to know more about my research, I run a research lab called the Spreadsheet Lab where I forge, force grad students to also like this stuff. <laughs> and if you want to connect, feel free to send me a tweet or send me an email to get to know more about the research that we're doing at Delft University of Technology. Questions? <laughs> Yeah, no, that, that is it a real book. I, it's my dissertation. Is that a real book? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's my dissertation. You can download the PDF from my website. But if you would prefer a hard copy, if you email or tweet me your postal address, I'm happy to also send you a hard copy. So about the, the question was, do you have enough type information to generate tests? So there were other researchers that worked on extracting types from spreadsheets. So I don't know actually, but now with your question, I think, yeah, you could maybe use the type in information that they are able to extract from spreadsheets to generate something. But yeah, the question would obviously be, are you going to look at existing input that's already in the spreadsheet? Or are you also going to think about what other possible inputs could be the case for every cell and how would that like change the coverage or something, that would be interesting. Uh, you, you've made the great point that spreadsheets are code, but Thank spreadsheets you. Are, are also data. Yes. Uh, and, and spreadsheets in, in general are a specific set of data. So what about the separation of the logic, like the code itself that you put here, and the specific input set? How do you separate those out and say, put the logic under source control and things like that? 
Yeah, so the question was how would you separate the logic from a spreadsheet from the data in a spreadsheet because that's, that's, it's not just code, it's also data. So I showed you the refactorings that I'm working on. They are now very low level, like changing formulas. But one of the things we want to do in the future is to make structural refactorings. So you could indeed take an existing spreadsheet and change the entire structure where you would say, I want all the logic in this one sheet or this one place and all the data in here. And that would obviously be a very nice first step towards migration to something else or at least a clear separation where you maybe protect all the logic and only leave the input open to the user. So I would say a good approach would be refactoring and then more high level refactoring, something like extract a worksheet. All the way at the back, the guy in the purple. Yeah, so your question would be, would it be possible to, to with, color, with a color system indicate what parts are input and what's calculation, what output? Yeah, so obviously within many of the tools that we do, we have an, an understanding of the spreadsheet in terms of what cells are input and what are calculations. So it wouldn't be that hard and need to color code that in a sense because we, have, we parse that information anyway. Yes. How, so your question is how compatible are different spreadsheet systems with each other? How easy it is to open? So that's a good question because for my research, basically I only looked at, looked at Excel because the type, of question, uh, the type of companies that we worked with were large banks, large investment companies. They, typically be, they would typically be Microsoft companies. So I would say if, you're, if your company depends on it, I wouldn't depend on those spreadsheet systems being convertible to each other. However, for you no know, general use, but it's hard to know because yeah, Excel is not entirely open, so there might be some strange behavior that we don't exactly know how it's implemented, but, and we do know how that works in open office. So I wouldn't bet my money on it. I've actually dealt with that. Oh. Between Google, between Google Docs and Excel, it's terrible. Oh, it's terrible. <laughs> 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 yes. Um, you spent this time sort of teaching us the names range, the distribution variable names, and I think as programmers we like naming variable names, but we know that naming is difficult, and you've seen a lot of real-world um, spreadsheets. In your in your experience, is the naming actually worthwhile? Is it okay? maybe just direct manipulation? Maybe we shouldn't get rid of the each range. That is perfectly tactile. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, do name ranges actually help? There's a girl, she's called Rose McDermott. She wrote her entire PhD thesis on the use of name ranges in Excel. And her, her main result was that it's actually not such a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so you can do it, but for, so it's a little bit more, more uh, nuanced than that. For experienced users, it really helps. So if you're an experienced user and you put in names, then you will benefit from it. But the problem with named ranges that she found was that if you hand over that spreadsheet to someone who doesn't know how the names work, then it starts to be really tricky. Because exactly as you see, well, as you say, you know E3, you can find it. But if you don't know how to find the names, it can be a little bit tricky in the Excel interface because you can also have the same name in different worksheets and they might point to different things. So it's all good if you, if you you know, as with, I would say, as with all difficult programming concepts, maybe something like macros, I would give the same advice. If you're an experienced user and you know what you're doing, it's awesome, but then someone else has to maintain your code and then suddenly it's not such a good idea anymore. 
I would say that, would ho that holds for named ranges as well. They only you help if you know how they work. But unlike macros, naming things is such a very elementary thing with programming. What does that result say about programming, right? Is it the case that the programmer means too much and we're used to it, but it was such a good idea after all? Yeah, maybe. Maybe. I mean, I didn't research that, but I can think about it a little bit. If you are, um, maybe it's intuitive for us. Maybe we are used to names, but maybe for you know, your, your normal average day guy that just wants to get something to work is not that necessary. I could think that that would be true. I, I think one of the things is cells already have names. Sure. Yeah. And a name range is essentially like an alias. Right. So think, oh, is aliasing good? Oh, maybe then the name range is not good. Yeah, that's an interesting way to put it. Yeah, you could say that E3 is a name in a sense. But you could say it's a pointer as well on this. <laughs> Maybe you would think differently. Final question. So what what's exactly the question? So it's true that Excel is super smart. If you copy paste formulas from here to there, then it will automatically update the, re update the references, and most of the times that what that is what you want. So when you show that to the name range on the first thought, is that you're sort of saying those are automatic steps, and you're checking yeah. So yeah, that's that's very true because if you would have a name range here, and then you would drag. So suppose you have named all these cells, you put a formula here and you drag it down, it doesn't automatically refer to all the cells that are next to it. So in a sense, by adding the names, you are interfering a little bit with the things that Excel can do based on the references. But then again, on the other hand, you, if you see the differences between those two formulas, and if you're looking at it six months later, maybe you would prefer to invest a little bit more time in making the spreadsheet and not relying on the building logic so much because it will be more maintainable if you come back to it with the names. So that might be a trade-off between investing, investing your time in more readable code now or getting something quick now and then being sorry later. Okay, one more then or two more. Um, yes. No, I have not explored dynamic programming. Would be interesting though, because you would say that the layout of the spreadsheet would be nice to visualize. That could be my next strange loop talk. Thanks for the suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, there's, you know, you refer to kind of the sociology of, of spreadsheets as, as you know, flow programming is like poor cousins. I think. Uh, you know, you should look at the birds of a feather on session. Oh, cool. So you're already considering it's a real programming language. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you. If you want to know more, please get in touch in our seminar. <laughs>